my signature style started in graduate school at Pratt Institute of Art. I was majoring in printmaking and minoring in drawing. And I believe that it all started from me looking at nature. Most of my work were landscapes at the time. And um, I can recall flying in my first flight with my father as a child. And I think just that idea, it's so magical, flying over land and being so high up. You know, it's almost as though maybe you're looking at a movie when you're looking out the window. It's almost not true. It's very hard to grasp, I think, especially as a child. But as an adult, I just, I always love sitting by the window and looking down at these different land masses that the farmland cut up or what might be a forest. And so there's no, you know, rhyme or reason as to why things are ending where they end. I'm Nanette Carter. I'm an artist. I live in New York City and I teach at Pratt Institute. My work is abstract and surreal and the recent works now have a cartoonish flavor to them. Um, but I'm, I'm basically an abstractionist. I want you to see some of my new pieces. The, the work is called Cantilevered. I normally work in a series. I've had series that have gone as, as high as 107 works. So once I get involved with an idea and it really sort of permeates my body, I just, I let it flow. Right now, Cantilevered, there may be about 27 pieces, large and small. I like working large, I love working small also, I have no problems with scale. But with Cantilevered, my idea was that living in the 21st century, all of us are having so many burdens, so many responsibilities. Some of us have three jobs, children, elderly parents, uh, social media trying to keep up with all that's going on, just so much to handle. Um, these are hard times, but they're good times, you know. And so with this series, I thought the idea of this architectural term, cantilevered, was a great way of talking about this balancing. In cantilevered, in this, the buildings that are cantilevered, you have a structure that is amazingly holding up this whole unit. So. What I'm envisioning is that this is hitting the ground. This is the ground here. This pediment right here, along with this weight-bearing structure, is holding up this entire piece. This is a collage. And so like building a building, I feel as though I am a builder. I am putting these pieces up one at a time, just as a builder would do. Of course, I'm thinking about not only the structure, again, this cantilevered idea, but color in this instance, shapes, these forms that I have, uh, this idea of stabilizing this unit and kind of just the excitement and the tension of all of this going on at once. And again, I see this as the human form in many ways as our arms are opened up, handling all of these uh, responsibilities. When I start my works, many times I'll start with small drawings, but when I go to scale them up, most of the times I have to change it just a bit. So I'll first start with paper, as you see here. I have taped up a large piece of white paper, and I'll draw onto the paper realizing that from my small sketch to this larger shape, things are going to change. And I allow for that to happen. I'm very open for that. But in this structure, I'm showing, in my mind, 
what seem to be sort of like columns or elements that are helping to hold up that next section as it goes up, as it's built up higher and higher. And uh, I, I'm really enjoying this series. A lot of my work is coming from what I've read. What motivated me to create art was probably my mother. My mother was a dancer and she taught dance and so she choreographed for recitals, for her dance recitals. She taught children from the age of six on up to high school, so 17, 18. And we put on these huge recitals. This was in Orange, New Jersey. And seeing my mother uh, try out her steps for these choreographed pieces, also watching her design and sew the costumes. She would sew the costumes. She was somewhat of a seamstress. And watching her work with taffeta and lace and all of these beautiful fabrics and colors and sparkly things, um, I it just looked like a lot of fun. Of course, I thought everybody's mother did this. And I think that I thought to myself, you know, I can create things too. This idea of bringing fabric together, you know, to make this tutu, to make this outfit, looked really exciting. It was quite enticing. So I think that's what started it. And again, I probably thought everybody did this. All of my work is oils on mylar. Mylar is a plastic that was used years ago by the architects at first because it's slightly transparent and because it's plastic, it's going nowhere. Um, so it is archival, it's stable, and I'm using oils to create these surfaces and all of these surfaces are made by me. Um, some of them even have, I think, a fabric-like quality to them. In this instance, it's these three columns at the bottom that you see that are holding up this entire structure. And the columns actually are going behind and within that structure, kind of the spine again, and we see them reiterated again at the top uh, with this cantilevered form even at the top. Um, so again, in this particular one, things are being held together. They're moving. I think there is this sense of movement, as you see, for instance, this green that's coming behind all of this that's in the foreground. It's going behind. We're seeing the green here, the blue on either side. Somehow it's being balanced, um, but it's precarious as it stands on these three columns. You know, when I first started out creating art, I was really trying to work with the figure. I was really just trying to ground myself in some of the more academic, you know, situations so that I could better myself and my hand, my eye-hand control. And um, so a lot of it, too, dealt with what a professor wanted me to do. But I do know that my father actually had an awful lot of influence on my work because he was involved with politics. And so we always had lots of periodicals in the house. We would get the New York Times, the New Jersey Star-Ledger, I grew up in Jersey, um, Time Magazine, Newsweek Magazine, Look Magazine, Ebony Magazine, Jet Magazine. So lots of periodicals were coming in the house, lots of information about the black movement, um, you know, about, about different political things that were going on in our country. And so seeing my father and my mother reading these and hearing talk at the dinner table about a lot of the topics of the day, I know all of this had an impact on me. Uh, because of my father being in politics, we would have lots of people over for dinner, interesting people of all situations, um, coming in, sitting at the table, you know, breaking bread together, but also great conversations coming out. Sometimes people didn't agree with each other. Um, you know, so I'd see some battles going on. 
And so this all intrigued me a great deal. So I know that that was a part of, of my impetus also in creating art. This is a woodcut that I produced back in the 80s. I did a series of these. Um, and what I thought was so uh, unique about this particular body of work was how not only I was carving the wood, but how I was building what I called my appendages off of the wood. Uh, I think there's almost an Asian quality to some of these. Uh, shapes and this sort of very slow moving line here that just slightly curves up reminds me a little bit of a pagoda possibly um, i just got back from japan and i can tell you that at a very young age looking at national geographic i knew one day i was going to go to japan i wanted to see the tadaiji temple I had a list of things that I wanted to do, and I finally had a chance to do that. Uh, this summer I had a show in Osaka, and I was in Japan for uh, a month. But I can tell you that some of the things I was looking at also as a child were the woodcuts. I love the woodcuts. The ukiyo-e period of woodcuts uh, are just gorgeous with the patterning, the cloth, this movement and flow of the, of the cloth um, really influenced me and my eye and the sense of, of these forms that they made, that the, the clothing made in particular. And I think the artist really highlighted the fabrics. Of course, these were silks and really quality made pieces. So to go to Japan and see some of the authentic work was exceptional. And I think that Again, even in the 80s, I was always still reflecting on some of the things that I saw uh, as a child. And I must say, I did study um, Asian art. It was very broad because it included uh, Korea and China, because as you can imagine, it was uh, quite broad. But uh, it still gave me a, a flavor and a sense of the history. Uh, before Cantilevered, I did a series that was called Bouquet for Loving. Uh, it had multiple meanings. It was a layered uh, meaning to it, and it was paying homage to my mentor, Al Loving. And this was a big black man who was so kind and gracious and giving of his knowledge. He was a brilliant artist and a wonderful collagist like myself. And he was just so generous with people he knew. He introduced me to quite a few people who helped my career tremendously. Um, I learned from him in terms of art making and the possibilities. And uh, so I wanted to to honor him. I, I wanted to pay homage to him. He died in 2005. And uh, so I did this series that was also talking at the time about what I saw as the lack of civility that was coming into our vision here in, in, in this country and how people were dealing with each other and the language that they would use and how harsh it could be sometimes. And I think it really played out um, when Obama first became president, uh, especially in 2008, and the series did go on through 2008 when he was in the halls of Congress. And as he was speaking, someone yelled out from the Republican side, you lie. And this has never been done, ever, during anyone's presidency. And I just felt the only reason why this white man from the South felt he could do that was because this was a black man. He did not like seeing this black man as his president. It took this gentleman weeks to apologize to Obama. This was at the same time that the whole birther business was going on as to you know whether Obama was born in our country. Um, so again, I just, I began to see this changing of the tide of communications and how we dealt with each other and not just 
you know, in emails and, and what have you, but also on TV. Um, and again, the halls of Congress. So bouquet for loving is me not only paying homage to our loving, but this bouquet is in hopes of people having more respect for each other and love for each other. Uh, back to sort of the flower child era, you know, um, love and peace. And uh, hoping that we will see that we need to get back to that. Um, this happens to be primarily a drawing. There's not as much collaging going on in this. This is one sheet of mylar that I'm drawing on. So this is actually lead pencil, color pencil, um, oil, stick, and there's one collaged element, and that's the element, this red-black element here. I even have a woodcut print. This is actually a print from a piece of wood. Uh, that particular flower and as you can see these are my flowers these are my creative flowers these are flowers you've never seen before this is vegetation that is not known to man I'm being very creative in terms of how I um, develop my flowers some of them look quite ominous uh, and some I think have a much uh, more fluid and, and friendly feel to it but again sort of this cartoon like quality um, that's in the work now that started probably probably in the late 90s I started to use more cartoon-like um, imagery. In the African-American community there's a history of figurative art. It was during the Harlem Renaissance that I believe this clarion call went out writers, musicians, visual artists, their communities, their black experience, their history. And clearly, because we had been told that we were lesser than, this was probably the start of identity art as such. And it was needed. Blacks were not in the museums at all. They're, uh, faces were not in museums, their bodies, their art. And so the idea was to bring dignity and show that we are regular people. And you had artists like Romare Bearden, um, who not only depicted Harlem, but also went back to his parents' home in North Carolina, Meckenbridge, North Carolina, and began to create works about the folks, the good people who lived on farms, who lived on the land, um, and their day-to-day -day activities. And he brought, again, dignity to these people and what they were doing, living their lives. Um, certainly Jacob Lawrence uh, was someone who came out of that era, who wanted to show Harlem. Children at school, people going to work, the great migration coming up from the South. And so this idea of representing ourselves, showing ourselves as people that eat and marry and have babies and families and love their families was what we needed to see in the community. And even today, artists like Kerry James Marshall and Kehinde Wiley are really trying to show our blacks in, in a beautiful light, again, with dignity and grace and, and that are thoughtful and thinking people. And you see that in their faces, in the faces that they're depicting. So for an African-American to do abstract art, it's a bit of an anathema to, to the black community. It's, it's, it's um, another language and as opposed to just relaxing and looking and looking at the creativity and the color and, and, and texture and line and, and just enjoying what you're seeing in terms of form and space, you know, it's, it's not the message that 
we're so used to seeing or we feel as though we need to still see. And in many cases, we do. We do. Um, and at last, I mean, Akehende Wiley is in, you know, the Metropolitan Museum. Um, and my gosh, Kerry James Marshall is about to have what I believe is the first solo show at the Metropolitan Museum. This was the first vertical piece that I did. Um, again, I think that the verticality gives the sense of the figure and possibly the legs of this figure, three legs, uh, that's holding up this whole structure. Um, I like to juxtapose patterns and colors. Um, there's almost a, a patchwork quilt-like feeling, I think, to this particular one. I know the women from G's Bend are, are works that I've been looking at, some of the uh, amazing fabrics that they chose and, and put together to orchestrate these gorgeous pieces. Again, builders. I feel as though you're building you know, many pieces to become this whole. In this particular piece, I think I'm going to start to do more installation-like work. Uh, again, this is not work that's held together all in one piece, but has to be installed whenever I move it because they're floating pieces. But it's still dealing with this idea of things tilting, things not quite being what you would like them to be, a stack of these elements that are teetering over um, still very much a part of my mind. I think that it's really kind of this sense of the 21st century. As a woman in this art field, um, it's had its trying moments. I feel that in many ways, for me, it's possibly even been triple jeopardy. Um, being an African American, a woman, and an abstractionist. Um, but I don't like to, you know, linger into some of the problems and stuff. They're there. I have to push forward. I have to move forward. I have been lucky in that I've shown in probably some of the top African American galleries in the country. Uh, June Kelly in Soho and Georgia Namdi in Detroit. So I've been very lucky in that way, but uh, you know, it's, it, it can be trying. And it's certainly a career filled with white males that are being exhibited widely and have been, and that's just been the status quo. Um, there have been some breakthroughs. And I can tell you from the 70s to the 80s when there were very few uh, chances of an African-American female abstractionist showing to today where we have Alma Thomas finally being recognized. Um, you know, we have folks who've never been viewed seriously or talked about seriously. Betty Blayton, wonderful artist. Um, people don't know her. Um, I've asked people, you know, give me the names of five African-American female artists who work in the abstract vein, and no one, people can't come up with but maybe one or two names. I'll ask people if they can give me ten names of African-American artists. And people can't do it. We're just, we're not being publicized, we're not being... Uh, curated into some of the important shows, the exhibitions, and then you'll get someone like a Chikaya Booker who all of a sudden can break through. Uh, so there have been some breakthroughs. There have been. I think my choice of topics uh, are really what keep me going, number one. Um, I do get really involved in, in what I'm doing. I really immerse myself in my topics. But also, there's this wonderful uh, 
nature of just creating things, making things. Um, and I think it's something that's always been very mystical for, for people, for anyone creating anything, whether it be music or literature or whatever. You know, bringing your ideas and, and making them work so that they communicate a message, so that others can receive that message. And uh, I just, I enjoy turning on my jazz, coming into my studio in the morning uh, with my paints and my brushes and my mylar and just getting to work. I, I am one of these artists that I don't have artist blocks. I don't, there have not really been periods where I couldn't think of something that I wanted to, to create. I've been very lucky in that way. Um, every day I can just get up and work and, and be a very happy soul. Uh, it's just a part of my nature now. I think any artist grows as they look at other artists' works, uh, through their experiences, again, through what they've read. Um, and being in the studio every day you know, you begin to really kind of narrow down some of the ideas that you want to project or how you want to project them. You know, just consistently working, you're going to grow. Um, and again, experiencing and, and seeing other artists. I think going out to galleries and going to museums, uh, looking in books, going to people's studios and asking them questions about their art. Um, just, and, and teaching, definitely teaching. I receive a lot of energy from my students. I have to say, there's never been a student where I have been influenced by their work, but I'm influenced by just this whole idea of this world of ideas. Um, seeing and working with young people and helping them to see the direction they want to go in, you know, whatever it might be, whether it's conceptual art, surreal art, abstract art, figurative art, whatever, whatever it is they want to say. Again, this world of ideas, I think, also has helped me to grow as an artist.